Okay, I think we can start. Uh, hello, thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, this is a class about, it's called the class to the screenwriter. Um, um, how many of you have been uh, uh, here for the class of Max Hour a couple of days ago? Good, uh, okay, one third more or less. Yeah. This is said a lot of things that's very, very interesting and it, it changed sort of what I, I was doing because it was uh, assessing uh, um, mostly things that in general uh, we have to say about the script. So I think I want to use this uh, hour and a half a little more and uh, of course with all the time that you want to ask questions uh, to go a little more deeper into some issues of, of technique about uh, what it is a script, what it is a writing a script and what it is a craft. And, uh, I would like to use some examples because that is great to avoid you falling asleep uh, by listening to my words. Uh, what, have, what do I have to say here? Okay. Um, first things first, I uh, you know you who I am. I'm not famous as many of the guests that are here. I, my name is uh, Giovanni Robiano, I'm from Italy, pretty old person. I'm a, I'm a screenwriter, I've been uh, working as a screenwriter for 30 years, a little more, maybe. Um, I've been directing features, I've been producing features, but mostly I write films in the last five, six years, mostly in TV series, so maybe that uh, at some point we will we'll try and take a look at some, uh, um, because it's very popular now, TV series, you all see them, and uh, there are some differences. So some of you are going to be writing for TV and writing episodes. There will be some little but substantial uh, difference in, in the craft, in the technique, in the organization. Um, I've been studying and, and graduating at, uh, a long time ago in the field department at Columbia University in New York, which is a very famous screenwriting department with beautiful teachers. And uh, I returned home in Italy and I uh, started working. Uh, then I had a, a career and about 20 years ago I started teaching. First I was teaching script, uh, which meant uh, having uh, young screenwriters come into a class and discussing about their stories, then the thing became more organized. I was studying, I was teaching at the University of Bologna, which is the same university where I graduated, and I was teaching all around. I started teaching for the European, uh, uh, European Union in the media program uh, about the year 2000, so about almost 20 years, and uh, from there on I've been teaching around script would be story editor and be a tutor in the script even here. I have some, uh, I can see some faces but I will not uh, point at them because they would be shy. Uh, so here I'm here as, a, as a, I would say an expert in, uh, in tutoring uh, uh, four projects among uh, uh, a list of ten that have been selected for, uh, for internal competition and I hope we'll bring as many as possible of these uh, young writers, and that's young writers, but for most cases, first time directors and, and writers to establish a career in film. And frankly, I hope to establish career for screenwriters because believe me, it's the best job. You have much less stress than directors, producers, you get a little less money. But then, if you feel that you get invited to festivals, that you can travel a lot of, uh, along the world. Uh, in my teaching career, my highest peak was that uh, some four years ago I was called, among other things, I was called to direct the international department at uh, uh, say one of the most famous film schools in uh, the world, which is Prague, the Czech Republic, FAMO, is a very famous school. I would say it's not uh, probably at the standards that it established in the 60s and the, and the 70s. But uh, it was very prestigious, and that led me some, uh, I think, four years or three years ago for the first time in Kazakhstan. I was guest of Amati, but what it was then the Eurasian Film Festival, and, and I started a collaboration, and uh, 
I'm so happy because one of the one student that I have I have in, in private is not here. He's doing other things probably. The work is a festival. He's now uh, established in Asia, so he's probably to be at his school soon and teaching. He's a film teacher and he's a good friend. And it's one of the reasons why we can't get So, having said that, um, I wouldn't like to spend much, much time. So, how many of you have a knowledge of what a script is? Please raise your hands. Okay. General, how many of you have a technical knowledge which means they have experience in writing scripts? Oh, a lot. So we give a lot of things for granted. So I don't have to show you how the script looks and I can go directly to, uh, to examples. What I want to tell is as fast as possible to indicate what what the script requires, what you need to write a film and to make it into uh, a feature. And for some of you, of course, those who have been writing script, it will be, this thing will be pretty obvious. Um, writing a script means that you're narrating a story to an audience. Uh, narrating a story is uh, sort of making a list, a chronological list, of events that happen to one or more characters. So the first element that you have in the story is a character. It's a very, very important issue because you cannot tell a story if you don't know who the story is related to. If you don't know your characters, the story is very generic. And if it's very generic, it doesn't draw any interest in the audience. They get bored and they don't see yourself. They leave it. So the most of energy that you spend, and this is something that I would say, young filmmakers or initial writer are less careful because they think that their story is a succession of events or what we call a plot. They spend much more energy and time in setting up a plot, which is a minor, I mean, it's not a minor thing, it's what happens in the movie, but believe me, it's a consequence of who does what. The most important element you have in the story is your character, possibly your main character. Uh, the better you know him, the better you know what he will do, the better his behavior will be believable, the better his choices will be understood and will draw interest in the audience. And basically, you can write a story about anything. There are Americans say that they're, because they like to categorize things, that there are basically two kinds of stories that you write, or two kinds of things that you can make. There are things that are character driven and those things that are plot driven. So to put it simply, most of the stories, much more interesting stories that you have are character driven. But of course, character is doing something. So if you're doing uh, uh, Independence Day, it's an example of a stupid film, but a film that I love, even if it's stupid, probably I love it because it's stupid. That's about invading the earth. So the character are less emphasized towards or in parallel of what is happening. The extraterrestrials are coming, they're destroying all the planet. We don't have much time for psychology. We have to face an immediate danger. Uh, and, the, and the dimension of the danger takes over the sort of the internal life or internal struggle of the character. But sometimes there are, there are some uh, plot driven uh, things that have very, very strong characters. Some of these characters remain. And sometimes you see you see films like if you see James Bond, James Bond, as I said to somebody yesterday, you don't call him to, to uh, fix traffic, even if he's a sort of policeman. Uh, James Bond deals with the uh, high plots. So you, normally there's somebody who wants to take over the world, and, and James Bond comes, eats a lot of brains, sleeps with a lot of women, but saves the heart. The, not the heart, the earth, the, the planet. Uh, so I'm not in English, um, it's not my, my uh, modern language. Um, so you are interested in seeing, you recognize a character which you're fascinated by, it's so fascinated that you keep seeing this film for now 50 years, and it's been like at least 10 different things one. And I heard that the next one made me black. I heard Idris Elba made me maybe too, so that's the uh, The next James Bond, but it's a little old. Uh, and so James Bond characters become old. You cannot have Sean Connery anymore because he's 90. And you 
cannot do much uh, and save the planet because it just will die in the process. Um, in general, you are sort of dangling in your choices. You want to have a strong, you know, you want to have an impact story, or let's say, you know, we want to go making things in Hollywood, and, and uh, Hollywood is definitely a, a different part of the industry where you must have, in order to have a global story, you probably want to invest money in doing things like Transformers. But the Transformers is, is like a, a entertainment, right? It's like a, it's a joke, and I, I like it. You know, I, I, love, I love any Star Wars, uh, the last one are pretty boring, but I love the, 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 the initial one, which of course has to do with spaceship, planet, exotic location. All this was very, very interesting. I mean, you come here at the festival, and the films that you see most likely are films that have to do with humans. And, and their struggle and their problems. And what I suggest, frankly, if you start if you start writing a script, you better set yourself into some human character that you may be interested in, you may portray, and you may attract the interest of your audience. So I wanted to show you a film to start beginning for more, more practical discussion about uh, some issues that, that I can't find it, so I can't find a satisfying uh, link. So I will show you another thing, but before showing, I will show you the script. You will have here in front of us the script, and then we will see the scene uh, the script describes, and we'll make some consideration, we'll start asking you a question, you start asking me questions about what are the problems. We don't have hours, and this is not a course. This is just one hour and a half discussion where I try to give you some suggestions about how you write your movies in a more uh, efficient and more uh, satisfying way. So, I have set up some links here that you have seen, and I will move, I will move to, uh, what is it? Uh, what is this? Okay. Okay, this is the... This is our film look. This is how the script looks. Most of you have seen it. There's no division in pages, but this is page one, which is the, the title page. It's a, it's a script. This is a transcript, technically. It's not, even if it says an original script, but the original <coughs> screenplay of Apocalypse Now was written... Uh, this is reduced, so it's year 2001, yeah, so it was written in 70, the film was 79, I think, 78 or 79, so 20 more years. So what, the script appears with the, the name, the title of the film, the, those who write it, John Milius, Francis for Coppola, there's part, like the narration, some dialogues are written by Michael, Michael Hare, Michael Hare's good novelist, yeah. Years later, was the screenwriter of, of uh, Full Metal Jack. So he worked with Kubrick. Um, these are data that, okay, that uh, this file is being produced for, through a software that is called Final Draft. Uh, the copyright is 2001, very important. Normally, in, in the front page of the script, you will have some contact, and you have a date, because you write many versions of the script and you get lost. So you have to put, you know, first version, second, first draft, second draft, third draft, and you put the date. This is the draft of, uh, what is today? September, I lost that of time, 18. September 18, 2018. Okay, that's, a page of the script looks like this. Which is the first thing that we discuss. Because if you write a novel, we cover the full page. We don't have empty spaces. We don't have jumps between parts. Just roughly, can you read that? Huh? Okay. There are three parts in the script. And you all know that, but I have to repeat it. These are the captions. Captions are technical data that the production needs. You need to know if what you're writing, the part of the story, I'm not talking even about scenes now, but the part of the story that you're writing, it's inside or outside, if it's day or night. It's a matter of uh, lighting. That doesn't mean that 
you can write a scene and it's set up there, you shoot it at night, but you have to take care of lighting so the production knows what to do. This is where, this is not where the film will be shot, this is where it's set. So, even if it says Saigon Hotel, like I can tell you, this thing, will, this part was shot in the Philippines, probably, probably Manila. So probably now we're shot in the Philippines, not in, not in Vietnam. If the second block that you have, basically, roughly, what you see, in the order you see it, and it's even a technical indication, close shot, and this is not actually, okay, that's the beginning, fading. Exterior, simple image of trees there. It's a very indistinct. We don't know, and we don't even know in the film, as we see, where are we and even when are we, but that's something that we'll return after. So what we see is coconut trees being viewed through the veil of time or a dream. Wow, quite a description. No, I'm kind of sorry. I'm not introducing you about drama or we're going straight into how do you write a script. And you write what you will see. And you try to put in what you see some quality. So what is the quality in this sentence? What is the thing? You know, what you see, coconut trees. How do you see it? Has through the veil of time or through a dream? Then we'll see how the thing is done in the film. And you will judge if it's efficient or not. You know, somebody may say, oh, this is horrible. But I say, Apocalypse Now is a pretty successful film, still, just, yeah, it was made 40 years ago now, in 79, it's 40 years ago, just, and it's just released a new version. Occasionally, there's a, there's a coma, there's a full stop. The full stop, in general, when you write a script, means that you're moving to another image. So this is a block of, of what? Of visual information. What is visual information? It's something that you need to tell the story. So you don't start once upon a time during the Vietnam War. No, this is novel or essay. Film is describing what you see. It's visual drama. You, you, are you clear with this concept? Yes, but you know, it's a concept, a concept that you as writers will fight for the rest of your time because it's difficult to convey information only through images. It's a craft. That's why we're talking about the craft. Uh, occasionally, color smoke wafts through the frame, comma, yellow, and then violet. Now, in the film, you will not see any violet, but you will see yellow. There's a reason for that. I don't know. This is this is what the author wants to convey. But he said before that it's through the veil of time or the dream. Full stop. Music begins quite suggestive for 68, 69. Perhaps, no, it's not perhaps, it is the end by the doors. So, normally in the script that you write, you will not indicate that you're using a specific piece of music for a very, very simple reason, which some of you may understand. So why you don't put it? Yeah, no, you have to lower your voice because I'm deaf. Because not necessarily you own the copyright. Rights. The rights, especially of some very famous piece of music like something from, from the Doors. Now in '79, probably Coppola had this. This music was available for less. But today, if you have to buy a song from the Doors, say, even if Jim Morrison is long time dead, the lawyer representing the Doors will actually tear you apart. It's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, euros, and millions of pennies. So, be aware about this. You cannot use copyrighted material unless you buy it. So, that tells us that this is a transcript because it describes something that it's already in the movie. So, it, it refers to the finished book. And actually to it. But it's interesting because you see the difference between what is on paper and what is shown. Now, moving to the frame are skits of helicopters. Not that we could make them out as, as that, though, rather, are shapes that glide by at random. So all this description, you know, you understand that it's starting, it's starting only hoping to give a quality to what you see. So more, more than a quality, 
it's starting the process, which is the most important process in writing a script, of creating sense. Tell me if you're completely lost in what I'm saying, because it's the basis. What is sense? Well, sense is a combination of some information that you know when you've seen the film, or when you write the film, so before it's done, you have to convey to the audience. You have to convey, for example, the first thing, and it's something that we tend to forget. Like yesterday, and you know, the pleasure that I had working with you, I had sometimes the instance, this is a comedy. Okay, how do I see it? If it's a comedy, I must understand immediately in the film that I am allowed to laugh. If it's not a comedy, like it is this film, I have to convey an image that tells me not only where I am in the jungle, but in what kind of film I am. And basically, this sequence will end up with a big explosion, because this is a war film. Now, it may sound obvious for you that if I talk about apocalypse now, we're talking about war film, but that's absolutely not obvious when you're writing it because the audience doesn't know, and it has to know through what you show them. So you're building the sense. Your first agenda, in, when you start a film, is to set in some points that allow the audience to do what? To understand what's going on. The first thing being, normally, who's the main character. In this case, the location or the ambience, or what is called, with a modern word, the arena, very industry analysis. You go to talking to some producer, especially international. What is your arena? You know what this arena is. The Colosseum is an arena. It's like a metaphor to say where your story takes place. And it's not the location. It's not Vietnam. It's the word of welfare in the past. But it's also a word where, uh, where humans are pushed to their extremes by a situation of immense strain, which is not a comedy, so I did an actual model, because you can understand immediately that is a comedy because the film starts with jokes, and you laugh immediately, and you set your mind with some correct understanding that the material that is arriving to you is comedy, whereas here it's not. Now, of course, when you build the sense, everything conveys the sense. Because if you start this film, and if you put the happy, I don't know, piece of music uh, kind of disco, you don't have the same effect of having a song like The End of the Doors that conveys what? Conveys sense, conveys impact, and above all, conveys some emotion. Now, one thing that I anticipate, and I'm trying to call you, you, you old filmmakers, Remember that when you will deal with film, you're dealing with two, with a complicated media. And the tendency that you have when you begin is to think that film is mostly images. Now, it is said by wiser people than me that images are in the film the part that talks to your brain because it gives the greatest amount of information that allow you to construct the illusion of reality that the film convey. Tell me if I'm too complicated or sort of philosophical. Am I? <coughs> oh, good. But the emotional part of the film comes through the soundtrack. So I to tell you. The music and the dialogues. Now the dialogues are not just words. The dialogues are a part of what the characters and therefore the actors. Yesterday I had dinner with an actor and we were discussing about that. Actors are not just saying words, it's just mere information. Actors are living. A part of our life is communication. In the film, the main form of communication the characters have is what they say. So, in a film, as you will see through the examples, character is revealed by his actions, and the most immediate action is what he says. So don't use dialogues to give information. I'll give you an example that may sound stupid, but it's... But Sometimes when we, so the greatest fear that we have when we write a film is that they will not understand. So I need to give more information. 
because they, they, which is you, the audience, will not understand. So we tend to overdo it. And we tend to give audience information that should be granted. Now, let's have an example. Imagine that you are coming back to your home, to your family, which is a system when you have a lot of information, you know who's who, and you know the characters, and it's like, I approach my son by telling him, Hi, how are you, my fourth son, 15 years old, having been born in this town and being a little rascal? And of course, my son is a little rascal. We look like that. Are you stupid? Yeah. Because there are things that you have to imply. Otherwise, the audience feel bored because you're throwing them with information. And I love the image that Max had of the sponge. I use it for two days. That's a beautiful image. You, you fill a sponge with water. Like I'm filling my son with a lot of water, telling you have to study, you have to study, study more. And he's like the filled sponge, you know, all the study goes down and doesn't stay. But that's a problem that I have. It's my problem. So the person in the film has his own problems, but problems that the essence of the life that we uh, conduct. So, okay, we can skip to this because you read it already, and we can move to resolve to say, I don't know this is what we'll see, close shot. Then we'll talk about the sense, but we'll talk about the sense when we see the images. Upside down with a stubble covered face of a young man, his eyes open, this is P.L. Willard. Look at that, that is fantastic. Intense, Anticipated. That's the description that the other gives us of the main character. He is intense and is dissipated. What it, it means a lot and it means nothing. But believe me, that's a very, very strong definition of a character. Intense and dissipated. I don't comment on that. It, it's, it's just good. The camera moves around to a side view as he continues to look up at the rotating fan on the ceiling. Images of helicopters day, so we come back to the originating image. They continue to fly slowly, peacefully across the burning jungle. The color smoke comes and goes, Morrison continues with the end. We're back inside the hotel, this is going to be edited. But of course, you know, you understand that when you're writing the script, you have to tell the guys that will shoot, in this case, Francis for Coppola is telling to himself, but not only to himself, to all the production crew, to the actor, to the costume designer. In order to tell this story, I need this narrative material. You have to give me these pieces of story. I need shot of helicopters, I need a burning forest, and I need somebody intense and dissipated in a hotel room inside. A in a hotel room, you can shoot it in a kitchen. Art department will set it up. You have to give them information. You're the writer. You are the master of the universe. There's no director at this point. Actually, you have much more power than anybody else will have, excluding the producer. Because before you come in as a writer, there's nothing. I mean, there may be a novel. There may be inspiration. When you're adapting, so you're taking material from another source, you're turning a novel into a film. The novel is not the film. And frankly, the complication of adapting something that has been, been made for another media are much more than creating a story by scratches, just through your inspiration. Why? Because in your inspiration, you are totally free. Somebody said it, and I like it. You're free. She said, really free. And you're so close. So if somebody said it on the back, I couldn't hear you or see. You're free. You're free to create, which is beautiful, but of course it offers problems because sometimes when you're adapting a novel, the novel is successful, it's good. But sometimes you have a novel that is too good to be adapted. Sometimes uh, there is sort of an idea that when you're adapting very successful books, the film is not to the level. But there's some films that are better than the books. You know, Pulp Fiction was adapted by a cheap Pulp Fiction book. The film is much better, nobody knows about the novel. Uh, you know, I mentioned Full Metal Jacket. The Full Metal Jacket is an adaptation of a novel. 
But the moment, nobody read it. The film, everybody seen. Well, you know what is the apocalypse now drawn from? You know, because you're a culture. You know, because that's when people are very educated. So a lot of you will know that the apocalypse now, it's a loose adaptation of Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness. So a novel that's been written hundred years before, set in Africa, but it's basically the same story. Somebody has to go up a river to meet some guy who's turning crazy. That's basically the story. Um, when I was checking the material and I was looking at the script of, of, of Full Vonti, I found something that I, I mentioned here, something that is called the log line. Uh, another thing that Max said is this phrase by Einstein, if, if you, if, I reverse it, if you know it well, you can talk in very few, in very few sentences. But the phrase actually, if you can't tell it in few sentences, you don't know it well. So when you write a script, you have to be able to grasp your film essence in a few words. And anybody familiar with this film, The Full Monty? It's a very popular film. Some have seen, very few, but okay. The log line is uh, God's uh, jobless Sheffield, uh, in Sheffield, God's jobless uh, needs to find money and convinces a group of a bunch of people among some friends to uh, perform a striptease act. That's one hour and a half in the film reduced intent. That's actually what happens. Now, when we get into, into the reasons why he do it, he needs money. Everybody needs money. Why he needs money? Why other people in the group that he convinces need to do this striptease act that will possibly humiliate them in front of the community because they have reasons. Characters are in the movie because they have reasons. They have a, a general reason, it's a drive, and they have a specific reason. The specific reason for Gus in that film is that if he doesn't get money, he will lose custody of his child. For others, it's different. You don't need to explain. You don't need to explain in the log line, he has a child, his wife wants to keep the child. He will lose cost too much. He needs money. That's enough. Because that is what drives the current. OK. Uh, it's, it's time to, to move from, from talks to images. And can we close the light? I think the What? Ah, uh, okay, take your scene in particular. All right. Uh, you see, we. Permit, uh, and I come closer to you. Um, talking about screenwriting, talking about the film, it's interesting. The point is that you, uh, what, I, what I'm more interested in my, in, my, in my life now is reading and, and understanding film language. I think that if you understand, and when you understand film language, you are better screenwriters, definitely you're much better filmmakers, as directors, whatever you are, producers, because nowadays you have to be able to know more or less everything. Uh, so what we're doing here is that through what this few minutes that we see, we, we, we squeeze all the information elements, because telling you a film, as I said, is giving the audience information. Now, the first thing that uh, that it's clear to you is there is no dialogues here. So all the information that you get, you get that from two sources, the images and the music. Hmm? Now, what is the title of this song? Yeah. Okay. But this film is beginning. Hmm? So don't you think that there's some in some way strange? Or there is a purpose in starting a film by listening to somebody that says this is the end. And to add to that, what you see in the film, if you, if you see in the film, when is it happening? When, not what, when? No, no, I mean in terms of 
in terms of the kind of the story, you can see in the film. No, you don't understand my question. Yet. What you see in the film is the actual end of the film. It's the destruction of the village where Kurtz is uh, hiding. Everything in this sequence sets you and drives you to understand the features of the film in terms of the symbols, the theme, the tone. Hmm? This is no comedy. Is it clear? How do you say it? Give me some answers. Why you say it's no comedy? Because you have destruction. What you have at the end of this traveling pan when Willard is sleeping? The gun. A gun. You have this person that sleeps with a gun under his pillow, which tells you, you know, in a bad script, somebody will say, I have to sleep with a gun because I am scared. No, they, you see it. You understand because you see it. And believe me, this is the craft and the gift of film that you starting to react to a story by having stimuli that affect you and touch you without being obvious. Why? Because they make your brain work. Work through association. If I see this, why do I see it? What is the meaning? And I'll go even deeper, because this is the first layer of symbol. Why do you have these images of helicopters and these images of fans? What conveys to you? I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm not asking questions if you don't answer, you're bad. No, it's a rhetorical question. Somebody, uh, not only somebody, all of you gather that information inside because these are repeated images of circularity and if you start a film by telling this is the end but it's the beginning you're telling that this story doesn't have a beginning it doesn't have an end because it's a circle and you know that the circle doesn't start and doesn't end come on cat as you said I don't know if it's <laughs> hmm? Not only, how do you approach, I can tell you, Captain Wheeler, the main character of the film. How do you see him? Well, the sleepy... Upside down? Like... Well, my dear, upside down, capsized. So the opposite of normality. Because if I look at you, you're straight, you're not upside down. And I don't talk to you <laughs> like that, because this is abnormal, not normal. So this character is a character who is cursed, which again tells us that everything in this film is not normal, linear. Everything hurts. You don't know and you cannot know this event if you live them, He's imagining them, or he portrays them in the future. Nothing tells you. You don't know. That's why I said when. When is very important. You know that he's somewhere. In the next scene, he says, Sidon, I'm still here in Sidon, waiting for a mission. What you see him doing, and I'll go on the next sequence, is a person that is waiting. But what can you tell about him? Do you recognize his <coughs> intense and dissipated in what you see? I think so, because he's waiting, but he's definitely mumbling, thinking, he's wedding, so it's not at ease, he's sleeping with a gun on his back. You have immediately a sense of some heart circumstance. Well, the guy will have a mission, and the mission will consist in he will be asked to go up the river and go kill an American officer. Now, through what you see in the first minute, can you convey a sense, a general sense, of what this film is about? So, this is a question that all of you that we've been work, working with, and all of you write the film, 
you will have be as repeated. Max said it perfectly. Finding Nemo is not about fishes. It's about growing. It's about becoming an adult. It's about becoming a responsible father. It's about losing your fears. Now, through what you've seen and these continuous images of abnormality, you probably start to approach without anybody telling you directly that this film, it's set during a war, but it's not about war. It is, I will tell you because we don't see it, it's about madness. Because when somebody, when some American officer is asked to kill another American officer, which is the next scene in the movie, he looks at the general, this beautiful scene, there's a young Arizona Ford, that is called to meet two officers, and they ask him, they, no, they ask him, they order him for a mission, they don't order, they ask if he, if he can perform this mission, what is the mission? And they start describing what he will do, he will go up the river, you will, uh, and then there's, a, there's an officer, and eventually they ask without asking, it's never said in the scene, they don't say you have to go and kill him. Actually, they use a beautiful paraphrasis. You have to terminate the command of Colonel Kurtz. And Willard, this same guy, looks at them because he doesn't understand what is asked. What is asked? Terminate the colonel. Because to terminate the command of somebody, you probably have to kill him. Nobody tells him, kill him because it's something absurd. Normally, in a war, you kill your enemies, you don't kill your allies or the people in your... And whatever happens in this film, it's an instance repeated through accidents, through events, of what is the madness of war. You will have a, a very famous episode where a major attacks a village and kills a lot of people because he wants to surf in the morning, surf. Somebody told him that there's a nice wave. Okay, let's go destroy the village. Kill 200 people. Why? Is there, is a, there is a war reason? No. There is a beautiful wave. And Willer is the witness that sees these events deploying in front of him and he loses the sense of what he's doing. And he understands that Kurtz, the one that he has to kill, is not crazy as they say, it is mentioned on this. This person believes is God and he's lost his mind, so he's crazy. And the more Kurtz Willer approaches him, the more he realizes that Kurtz, Marlon Brando, is not crazy. He's the only one that has understood this madness. And he decided, as he said, to take action. As this is the word of madness, I will kill everybody, because everybody's mad. That's the theme of the movie. The theme of the movie, you cannot tell it so directly. You know, somebody that stands up and says, you know what, in my experience here in Vietnam, I understood that this is madness. Because you, know, you can't reveal what you will use three hours to entertain your audience with. But the more you get into this sense of, and all of these images of being not normal, are designed to give you the sense that nothing that happens in this movie has a logic. As a logic, inner logic. Now the film has the logic of narrating a story, so it's consistent. What it portrays is a world or a universe where logic is completely lost, where actions are decided without any rationality. When you kill or you're engaged in a war, because what? Nobody knows. And you're asked to kill those who should be fighting with you. Okay, that's an example of a theme. I'll go to another example, if you don't mind, because I think the most interesting features in films and discuss about. But if you have questions, please tell me. In the few seconds that I'm reaching the the computer and moving, I I'll go today. I will have for you a couple of special. So, let me see, okay. Okay, this is interesting material because uh, 
Let's see this. No. Scrape, glass fire, glass fire. Glass fire is good. No, it's the same thing. Okay. I want you to see something that is. Look, for example, at this page, if you can read it. Uh, oh, but please. Okay, look at this, and if you can, if, can you read it? Okay. These are notes that the Paramount is making about the script of The Godfather. One of the best few ever made. See how it reads. Page 89, the restaurant scene in which Michael murders Solotso lacks suspense in the script. The audience should wonder, can he do it, will he do it, will he get away with it? You see, you write a script and the, the company that is producing the script is assessing new questions that are absolutely not abstract, that are designed to, will the audience understand, lack suspense. You have to understand if you will do it, how you will do it, and uh, the film. You remember the scene. The scene is very effective. It's very well done. But that's the concern that you have in the real world. You know, these people, I'm using American example just for a simple reason, that if I talk Godfather or Apocalypse, now more or less everybody has seen it. If I take one of my favorite uh, films, I don't know, from Germany or Spain or whatever, <coughs> Probably we're getting into, let's go, the films that all of the world has seen and some recognized masters, masterpieces. Page 95. I think it's a mistake that Mr. Adams so easily endorses gay marriage. That doesn't happen in the film. The scene is probably being cut. So, the concern of the studio had an effect in managing the scene. It was cut. Maybe it was shot, but it was not in the final version of the film. But, see page 100, the third note. We had a construction problem in that Connie, it's written here in some way, in that Carlo and Connie have been out of the story for so long. So, you know who Carlo and Connie are? The film starts with the wedding. That's the wedding of Connie, which is the only girl, the only daughter of, of Vito Corleone. It's a very long sequence, it's 26 minutes long. During the wedding of her daughter, the godfather meets people that are asking him favors. And Carlo, who is the husband of Connie, it's, he is the person that will betray the Corleone family. And later, Michael will I don't tell you what the godfather is. It's about, you probably all know. If not, it's a good thing to see it again. But the godfather is the story of the most important man in the mafia in New York, which is Italian. Sicilian actually, that and his son. And it's the story of how the son will become the new godfather. Because Vito will be shot, will not be effective, there will be a very long period, and the family will try to keep its power. But it's a film about a family. If when we will see the scene, the opening scene of Godfather, I will ask you in the end, and if you have the capability of reading film material, you will understand clearly what the film is about. And don't mix what it talks about, which is the mafia, like as Apocalypse Now talks about the Vietnam, talks about on what it is about, which is different. It has to do with the theme, not with the story that it tells. So you have to understand that the good story has two layers. One is what happens, where it happens, who it affects. The second is what it means. And stories, you cannot write 2,000 kind of stories. You know, once in, in the 50s, some guy made a sort of category of the stories that you can tell. And he came short of 20. Stories are about revenge, are about self salvation, are about reaching a goal, are about what, most likely, are about uh, fighting a, a, a strong conflict, like somebody wants to kill you or somebody wants to destroy you. So about defending. These are the dynamics, the conflict. 
The kings are referred to, if I am the most powerful man in the mob, in the crime, and somebody is trying to get the power from me, then the film is about power. It's about what it means to be that powerful. What choices you will make. Well, in The Godfather, Michael, who's a casino, who becomes the new Godfather, gets this power but destroys his family. And since the film is set in the family, at the end, he's the new Godfather. But he's not successful. Because Vito, Marlon, again, was able to hold power and to hold the family together. Michael is not. Vito, even if he's a ruthless murderer, is a sort of portrayed like an ancient wise king. And Al Pacino is a ruthless young prince that will stop at nothing. And as this film is very powerful and very effective, there is a very clear condition that is set in the beginning. In the beginning, in the first sequence, that Michael doesn't want to be involved with the Mafia. And Vito doesn't want his son to become who he is. So, again, if somebody wants something and that something doesn't happen, we understand that this film is about power, but it mirrors another huge team. Huge team, which is you cannot escape your I love these two girls. Your destiny. Because destiny is a force that humans cannot fight. You know, we live on the purpose that we are immortal. But unfortunately, I've been informed, sometime we will die. So why do we struggle? No? It's useless. Yet we do it. Because it's the sense of our life. Our struggle takes different forms. We want to become filmmaker. It's difficult. I would have to put a lot of energy and all my life towards that goal. Is it useful? You ultimately, well, you know, somebody would say when you're down the ground and eh, you're completely forgotten, why did you struggle so much? In fact, some way to see to see life through spiritually will tell you to just observe and, and think. No? Because there's a different meaning in their life. I am not particularly religious, but I respect this point of view. The in film, you have basically and inherently one person that is fighting to get something. Even if it's minimal, like you know, I have two hours to give to 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 give this parcel to somebody, or even if it's I need to say the word. So you combine all these things. What is the fourth? No, just for the <laughs> Please elucidate the murders. Okay. The page 109, we're towards the end. The use of flashback technique in only one piece in the screenplay is jolting. That's a technical thing. We should have all this all the all the material, but in, in general now you look, you can do anything. And you know, some people come up and tell, don't use flashback, don't use voiceover. It's okay. Some of the greatest masterpieces, and, and I was reading to prepare this, this, this class, and I don't want it because it's a very, very old film, the script of Sunset Boulevard. It, it goes against every law of drama. You know that the main character is dead at the beginning of the movie. He's telling the story backwards, so in a long flashback, and using voiceover at all time. Yet, it's Sunset Boulevard. We're still talking about that 70 years later, which, you know, it's a good feeling when you make a movie, that long after you will be dead, your film will survive. Mm -hmm. So, don't, don't get this, uh, it, it, this, again, you know, I, I completely agree that I fell in love with Max uh, by, by having breakfast with him. Don't be formulaic. Formal is one thing, formula like is formal like is even when they tell you not to do this. There's films where where this is uh, perfectly yeah, some of the greatest masterpieces are those who go against the rules. 
But as it was duly said, you cannot go against the rule if you don't know it, and if you don't know it really well. You have to know the fundamentals of drama. And the fundamentals of drama, the fundamental of drama, and the fundamental of film, which is so, of drama, is one person with some specifics has to do something to solve the problem. And you are following the story to the purpose. Will you do it or not? If you don't raise this big question, why? Which is not a why, another kind of why. You know. The problem is when somebody seeing your film asks directly to you, the other, why is this happening? I don't understand. You have to let them understand. They have to understand what's going on. And then the pleasure you see in the movie is to, so, to see the deployment of the narration with the purpose that I want to know where it ends. Which means that when a movie is predictable, when you understand too early how it's going to end, you are losing your interest. So, how do you manage a film like Sunset Boulevard, which is another example of more or less we know, when you know that the main character is floating in a pool dead at the beginning of the movie? Well, you want to know how it ended up there. What was the succession of facts that led him to die? And to tell the story back, what is important? And of course, you will enter into a world where you know, the film is pretty uh, immoral. You know, he becomes the, the lover or the gigolo of an old famed actress, completely crazy, that will feed him with a lot of money, good clothes, which your our character love to have because he's a bad screenwriter, that's why he filmed that all screenwriters love. It's a story about a screenwriter that is not successful, but he finds success by becoming a lover of an old woman. But this old woman wants, you know, it's easy, okay? I have an apartment, I have to perform maybe twice a week. Yeah, but what if she wants more? Hmm? Can you handle? No, it doesn't. And eventually when he wants to set himself free, because he falls for a girl, and he wants to change his life, he can't do it, and he gets killed. That's what happens, in a nutshell. One of the great masterpieces of the history of movies. Okay, now, if I don't find the script of The Godfather, which I lost, but I have to return because I can't so to YouTube and call for Godfather opening. Godfather open. And we enjoy opening scene. We enjoy great performance by Marlon Brando. I hope well you know it translates and, and we will know. Okay, let's go. Full screen, no, I did the opposite. Sorry. It was a little torture to see <coughs> beautiful lines by Mario Puzo being mistreated by this, uh, this, oh, this is already uh, by this uh, Miss Ace and the Spider. Despite, okay. Uh, some Paul Marva, Savona Sera, that's the name of it. Okay. Uh, this is the opening scene of Godfather. And uh, but this completely opposite what we see, same director. Even the same writer, even if you have different collaborators. This is all words. You, know, you, you, see, you have a, you had a, you had a, a film like Apocalypse Now, where it's completely not verbal, and there's a, a, you know, we're back and forth in time, in space. We go back to the jungle and back to the hotel. We in times. We have a construction where, where everything is indistinct. Time, place state of mind, you know, by the way, I want to ask <laughs> another thing, return to Apocalypse Now, because you see some, you see some, some bottle of alcohol, in, you know, later you will be drunk in the scene, There's somebody that is, is facing a sort of delirium. Okay, here is the opposite. From a point of view of, of mise-en-scene, and we talk about the greatest director in, in history, there are three shots, so probably Probably they become more, but the five minutes of the of the scene 
are, are managed with a cl this close up of, of Bonacera and a reverse shot of, uh, of Vito. Now, you don't even um, uh, you know, perceive, you just see it in the end, that when the, when the film starts, it's just this very, very slow zoom back, because it's not, you know, I had a discussion once with a student, no, that's a traveling, you know, there's, there's tracks, no, there's no tracks, it's just the zoom, because, of course, you cannot put, it passes over a desk, and it's, when you're experienced of set, you, you, you realize you don't need to have a, a elaborate. Now you will have a, a, a jibo or, or, or device. This is 1972. And, and you are opening the space and you are revealing Don Vito just with this movement of, that's why I said, take attention, where you, it's a little indication of the hand. Pay some attention, give him a Give him an handkerchief because he's crying. Okay. Bonacera is telling his story, he's coming to Don Vito. We don't know where we are, the film is starting, where, when, but we are definitely in a room. It, there's a sort of ritual, and this ritual, okay, you're familiar with the film, you, you've probably seen films about the mob, about the mafia. This is a ritual of paying homage, but it starts in the wrong way. Because Bonacera is going to Don Vito to ask in the moment where he bends to him and, and he asks, Vito is a practical man, what you want? You're coming here to ask, what you want? And basically he asks, I want them killed. Then Vito replies, but that's not justice. Your daughter is still alive. I can't kill them. Which tells us that Something that I will ask. So, Bonacera raises the stage and says, how much money do you want? And in this moment, in the, in the scene, you understand by a movement that what Bonacera says, it's at the verge of being really offensive. Because the other two people in the room react. The other two people are Don Vito's sons. One is a natural son, one is an adopted son. They are there to take part in this ritual and they move. Oh, 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 my God. You know, it's like you, you said something really gross, like you're going out with a, with a girl and you're making a move and you understand, oh, probably misunderstood. But Bonacera misunderstood to a level that can cost him in his life. But Vito, again, replies with some sort of patience. You know? kind of bother, and you're coming here on the day of the wedding of my daughter, and you are, why are you, you know, despite what you read, he says, why are you treating me so disrespectfully, without respect, in my home, and in a day like this? Come on. And you never came to ask for help, and you never came with friendship, and never came with Respect. So, if you pay homage, if you bend down, if you accept what? My power. I will help you. But you have to do something. And you know, it's not something special, but you have to kiss my hand. Because then you bend. I recognize your authority. And from that moment, you'll be protected. You never did that before. So we have, in this sequence, tone, somber, style. It's a very slow-paced film. It doesn't rush. And we have a deployment on, of what it means to be the godfather. And what it means is a combination of a lot of elements that you see clearly, even if they're not exposed. You see that the power is based on legacy, respect, family bonding, tradition. Hmm? This power is of immense status because you don't have to worry if I protect you. That's come good theory. 
just by the name of Don Vito, nobody would touch you because they'd be scared. That's exactly what he says. No? You went to the police, you know, and then the police didn't help you. Why? Because the power of the Godfather in that instance is much bigger than that of the police. Actually, the point is that Don Vito owns the police. He pays them. No? But, on the other hand, is the Godfather, this man of immense power, somebody that loses the sense of balance, or I would even use a sort of distorted but very actual sense of justice? No. He tells Bonacera, this is not justice. This is not a response to the offense that you have that is equally balanced. Because I can't do it. Because if I do it, I lose my authority. I go too far. So, we really have a sovereign, a king, a king that administers power, and administers power with judgment. He's a wise man. He's a wise man, but he's a killer. Is it a contradiction? Yes. But, you know, that's the point why we love the movie. Because we see the word of, the, of crime through a perspective where these people have a call of honor, and this call of honor, it is based on, it's not that we accept it because we like the mafia, sorry to say that. We accept it in the film because the base and the philosophy of this honor, of this law, is based on something that we all recognize, the Italian, Kazakis, America. What is that? Being faithful to your family. It's a white family. It's made of direct kids, but it's made also of those that enter into the family. That's why the film is called The Godfather. It's not called The Boss. Because The Godfather is a member, is an authoritative member of your family. Actually, it's the person who is the Godfather. It's the person that takes care of you. You have a Godfather. I think even in, uh, in, in uh, any culture, there is, or you have a sort of a mentor, an authority in the family. Hmm? So that is something that we can recognize. And we immediately, even if we don't sympathize, we immediately range Vito at some level where there's no messing with Vito, there's no, you know, no kidding, he's serious, but he's balanced. And this comment that he has in the end with, uh, with Tom, with Robert Duval, which is his lawyer and his adopted son, is we don't want to be carried away, you know, give it to somebody that we can trust, Clemenza. And, final comment, we're not mur murderers, despite, that was the word, you know, despite what this undertaker thinks. This Bonacera is an undertaker. He deals with that one. And, what is the price that you pay to have the protection, is it money? No. It's one day you will pay it back. And you will pay it back by fixing the dead body of Sonny, which is one of the two persons that you see in the scene. James Camp is the, is the member of the family that is bound to be the new godfather when Vito will, uh, will pull back. Sonny has a problem, though. he's stupid. He's lovely. It's a character I love most in The Godfather, but he's stupid. He always made the wrong choice at the wrong time. The new Godfather would be Michael, because Michael is brilliant, he's clever, and he's different. Now, without getting into the scene, because we don't have hours and hours, but if I like doing it, Michael arrives at this party with his girlfriend. His girlfriend is American. Everybody in the party is Sicilia. They just, they like to have a flag. The Sicilian flag is, is red and yellow. They, they all look Sicilians, and I'm not, I'm from the north. 
and, and there this blonde girl, Kay, Diane Keaton, comes, and Michael is immediately different. His girlfriend is American. These people are Italians. Tom is American, but he's been adopted in the family because he was, as a kid, he was an orphan. Okay, what time do we have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Leave it to your questions. We can say in a minute. We can say some more. Ten minutes. <coughs> now, of course, we didn't we didn't cover all the aspects of uh, what is the craft of a of a of a screenwriter and of a filmmaker. What is the nature or the secret of film language? But I hope this example provides you. Some sense of the, the tools that you want to use. Don't be explicit, don't be thin, always go for the best solution. The best solution always comes through understanding who's your main character. I'll give you another example that may be useful. Sometimes it is, sometimes not. How do you define a character? Uh, do you know people? Do you, know, do, do, you, do you really think that you know people in your world? People have secrets, even members of your family. But you have lots of information with them. And anytime you meet a person, anytime, in your normal life, something happens in your brain, which is a, something that uh, a screenwriter makes relentless. The screenwriters are very, very curious. They want to know about people. We, very, we like people, and we're very curious about them. We like to know about you, you all. What you do, who you are, what is your family, what is your job. And some of you all know. But what happens in your normal life is that you meet a person, even if it's somebody that is selling you, I don't know, a newspaper, and there's a process in your brain that starts scanning and gathering information. And you put this information in a sort of file. And basically what you want to know about another human in a reliable way are two things. Can it be useful or is it dangerous? So there's an issue of can I get something or do I risk something? When you risk something, you try to avoid it. Sometimes you answer very badly, say, I don't want to deal with you at all. When you think you can get something, and I don't mean money, it's only, even if one is a bit, the essential part of our life is to survive. To survive, we need other humans. If my job means, in short, like, like your job, like all the others here, that at some point you sit in front of somebody else, and what you have is an idea, and what he has is some money to turn your idea into something, complete a film. It, it's, it's, if you think it, oh my god, how can I do it? Well, you know, it happens every day. You sit, you convince somebody, look, my idea is great. Hmm. And he thinks, maybe with this idea I can get something. Prices, money, prestige, travel, connections, whatever. That's the trade that you make. In order to make this trade, you need to understand who you're facing. <coughs> when you meet the person that you will spend your life with, you start asking yourself, can it be the right person, and you just send probes, ding, and you judge the answers. Ah, she, I don't like this thing. I really like that thing. I like the taste that she has. I like the way she moves. But that's just a, a, an immediate superficial. And you want to go deep because you want to know if you can trust. That's how you make characters. Not that you, you find, because in film, the characters you're probably more interested are those that in life you want to avoid, the dangerous ones. Because we live in a life of, or we try to live in a life of comfort. That's why when you make a movie, you want to portray what upsets us, or what puts us in uh, some sort of uh, danger, just because it allows us to travel a territory that normally we don't pass. Hmm? So we don't have to do with murderers, but we're very interested in film about murderers. But if, we, if I know that there's a murderer here in the room, I want to be somewhere else. But if there's a film about a murderer, I sit. Uh, I'm curious. 
gives bad guys and of course exceptionally good guys. But you know, good guys that behave in a way because there's nothing more boring in a film than a good guy that behaves like a good guy from the beginning to the end. The people that we like in movies are those who are making unpredictable things because they surprise us. And there's some people that are like, you know, mid-class professors, boring people. But there's one that, you know, it, it, it tells you something that it, it got an influence on you and so on. And in general, to make this job, you have to have a range of being interested to basically everyone. And also to like, because by liking people, what happens is that you get deeper information. You get more information. So you add to your knowledge and to your skill. You become, yeah, I know, I understand people. Then you will get, uh, uh, you will get disappointments all the time because it's the human nature. But uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting way to, uh, and of course, you, know, you have to be a little tolerant. You can't be racist, biased, uh, against this, against that. It's just reduce your, reduce your possibilities. Okay. I'm all yours. Hey, I, I had a technical question. Uh, can you talk about your writing process in terms of scheduling? Like, do you do you write in the morning, in the evening, how many pages a day, and how does your writing process look? And then another another part of that question is, do you work out of an outline, and when do you know when when you shift from an outline to a first draft? I'm an old guy, so I, I, I work when I have energy to do it, uh, and, uh, but you know, the, despite the irony, uh, when, you work in, when, you, when you work in on a commitment, a professional thing, it's very good to have, a, to, have a, to have a routine. That doesn't mean you have to work eight hours a day. You know, a good two hours, uh, you sit, and you know, in our, in our job, and I, and I, you know, I talk to a colleague, in our job, the most work is thinking. The most, the most thing is just sitting and just trying to get. Done. Even if you're in front of the computer, you don't write. You know, you, you may write notes; they're they're useful. But you think, you see films because they, you know, you keep adding to your wardrobe. Yeah, I know. It's like when I'm talking to others, I, I make it look. In this film, uh, there's something that this thing is film. See, but my film is a comedy, and this is. Uh, this is uh, Independence Day, which is a comedy, by the way. Uh, yeah, but you know, that scene, that this relationship that, and it, it, it just shortcuts, you know, in other words, short, to arrive to the effort. I would say that in the modern world, you know, I'd say something industrial, writing the script, writing the draft, is the least thing. Especially when you write, and now I've been doing it for five, six years, when you write series. I've been writing, I've been working on a big series now four years, and we haven't, so one year ago I wrote a draft of the pilot, but it's long gone. We will start writing the scripts probably in the fall, but we spent years, years, in setting up the story, which technically is a very, very detailed outline. There's, there's a difference between film and TV series. TV series, the outline is the absolute in fact, it has a term that you probably know, it's called the Bible. You, you define everything, and the writer is just, you know, we had, we hired a writer who was a film writer, and not me, the producer. I'm showrunner on this, actually junior showrunner, even if I'm older, 15 years older showrunner, but I'm junior, because I'm set on it. In, uh, and we hired this, this film, to be very successful, he has great films on his back. And we give him the outline, and he starts changing his page one. He starts reading, he says, no, wait a minute, you know, he's, this is not happening in the outline. No, but I like it better. See, honestly, he was fired. Not because of me, because I'm a, I'm a very nice guy. But the, the, my colleague is a hard piece of, of ass. And after a week, he says, I can't work with you. You, know, you change everything. And, and basically, he was right. You know, we've been working on that day and night relentlessly for four years. Frankly, you know, I know, I, I, I even know the, the shoe size of, of the third girl uh, in, in, in that line. 
we, we pass. Everything that you come up, you have a better idea. We accept it. So we need, in TV, in TV series, you need a writer that writes in the most elegant way what is being decided by the creator. In film is different because, you know, I show, I, I, I treat you because I show the Apocalypse Now script. This is a transcript. The original script was written by John Williams. It's completely different. Completely different. Whereas, in Godfather, you take the novel by Mario Puzo. Godfather is an adaptation. And there are, that dialogue in the novel, it's the same. It's amazing. So Mario Puzo is an amazing writer. Was an amazing writer. So you have an adaptation. There is a film I was considering to show. It's a famous comedy. Uh, the, the Graduate. Dustin Hoffman. You may have seen it. It's a film now 60 years ago. Not 60, 50. Uh, and uh, and if, you see, if you read the novel by Charles Webb, the lines, the funny lines, are exactly the same. Who wrote the script just translated what was in, in the book. So that was kind of an easy adaptation. But of course, you know, sorry if I continue on this. One of the greatest adaptations of, of our days is uh, Silence of the Lambs. Thomas Harris' novel. I don't know if you read the novel. But you've seen the film, Jonathan Dent. You know, in the novel, uh, Hannibal is a secondary character. Clarice goes to meet him in the beginning. He gives her some suggestion. And then for 300 pages, she looks for Buffalo Bill. The, the genius idea of the writer, Ted Talley and Jonathan Demme, who then met him once, poor guy, he died three years ago, great director, was to cut off, and by reading their material, you know, here there's a character that is legendary, and in fact became so legendary that 20 years later we still have the series about Hannibal, because Hannibal Lecter is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, and so you, take, you make choices of time. You make choices that may be very, very sharp. You know, one of them, there is like a legend in the industry. Proust cannot be adapted. People have, you know, this country tried for 20 years to adapt La Recherche. And, and he came out with a script that it can't be named. But there's another legendary novel that nobody wanted to approach, which is science fiction novel, very famous one, Dune. There's, there, there are at least three versions of it. And one is David Lynch. Now, you know that uh, David Lynch Dune destroyed the company. It was a gigantic flop. Still, I think the film is amazing. But you know, David Lynch took a, a thousand page novel and chopped 600 pages of it. And in the film, there's a moment, I don't know if you remember that, like, you know, if not. There's a moment where it has a sort of summary. It's a meanwhile, and meanwhile is 300 pages of the novel. And, and uh, frankly, things happen in the film that you don't understand. But to me, the film is David Lynch at his uh, best. It's fantastic. It's great. It, it's pure entertainment. I don't understand uh, much of the of the connections, but it's great. Okay, please. The question is, uh, how many, how many teams uh, could be? I don't, I don't, I don't say, say, say the, 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 how many teams? Ah, teams, ah, teams, teams, teams. I was thinking teams like football teams. In a film, that's a good question. That's a good question. Now, Godfather has many teams: the family, the power, the faith. It's a film that starts by somebody who says, I believe in America. So clearly, it's a film about America. Actually, it's a film about how America changed, how the crime changed. It was a family business. In, in the film, if you know, there's a repeated mantra. There's a repeated sentence. This is business, is not personal. It's the story of how the business of crime passed from being personal, family, to become industrial, business. Because Michael, Vito, and I give you an example of him. Vito takes all of his decisions based on the family's interest. Michael takes all his decisions based on business interest. 
That's the difference between this. And that's the tragedy of the story. Because Michael was protecting the family. Uh, sorry, Vito was protecting the family. Michael destroys it. So there is a team, even in that. I would say, Apocalypse Now is a film with a lot of teams. If you're able to gather a story, but you have to understand, you know, the size of the story defines its span. You have to be able to understand that Full Monty is a very, very simple, non-pretentious film. But then, maybe the themes are attached to a film even because it's so successful. Because, of course, it became a film that was very uh, important to to accept a lot of things, you know, how do you, how do you fight for your uh, dignity when you don't have a job, when you don't have money, when you don't have a... Uh, and to fight for your dignity, you have to explore ways that you will never explore, like getting undressed in front of others, which of course is a paradox. So, this G3, uh, compared with the, with the size of your film, the story that you make, there would be... A, I call this, when I, when I talk to students, I call this film potential. There is a potential of film to be commercially successful. Uh -huh. and, there's, and, sorry, and there's a potential of, being, uh, of having bigger content. Uh, can I make a second part of this question? Uh, what's the difference between uh, 30, 36 dramatic situations and team? What's the difference? difference between dramatic situation and theme. Dramatic situation is something that happens in the movie. Theme doesn't happen in the movie. Theme is, is what the movie conveys. Dramatic situation is, I am the head of the mafia, somebody wants to kill my family, what am I doing? Which of course is a huge problem. It's a big dramatic situation. Because it has to do, it can be rephrasing, how do I keep my power? Power is the theme. How do I keep it is the problem. Dramatic, you know, dra drama, drama means action. In Greek, drama means to act, which tells you that in film, films must happen. Happen. You, you have to see that. Not being told, you have to see that in your eyes. Things are happening in front of your eyes so that you make the judgment. Judgment is one condition that leads you to understand what the film is about. It may sound thin, but it's a big difference. And eventually, you will be clear. Uh, any film that you see, and you see here, I don't know how to make an example, because the only one that's seen is the Dragona, and already uh, Tom. Uh, uh, mass trash thing. I think you know, it doesn't have to be trash, but it's a little mess. It's a little mess. It's too much to handle. Uh, what happens in the film? It's you know, the, pro the problem. Let's say, let's forget the travel, but there's a community that is under, under the power of an evil uh, force, and they will fight to get their freedom. Now, that is what happens. Now, the theme is, uh, to what extent will you go, or, or will you be courageous enough to rebel to a, a negative death? Of course, I'm talking of a fairy tale. In, and in fairy tale, themes are very evident. But, you know, I'll give you an example about that everybody will understand in terms of history of drama. The, the best screenwriter ever is Shakespeare. Any of the Shakespeare drama tragedies, you tag them with a theme. But no, I say Othello is a tragedy of jealousy. Lear is a tragedy of ambition. But what is the dramatic problem or the dramatic action? Macbeth wants to be king. It's not a theme. Of course, being king, being, being king means to him uh, something that, that, that is essential to his life. You know, Otello wants this demo. He doesn't want to be jealous. He gets driven by jealousy 
and actually by jealousy loses his mind because he's tricked by Yahweh. That's the one is not betraying him. Amlet, Amlet is, is kind of a, you know, not an example of many teams because Amlet is the tragedy of vengeance, but it's also the tragedy of being uh, irresolute. Because Hamlet is somebody that, at one third of the tragedy, says to be or not to be, which becomes to act or not to act. And when he acts, again, he messes up a lot because he will cause immense tragedy. But that's a tragedy. You know, the consequences of the act of man in a tragedy are disastrous. And and we can go on with all with all the others. Now, Team Lear. Lear is the tragedy of uh, uh, of not being uh, uh, respectful of of, uh, of 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 your old father. I don't know. I don't know what is the word of, uh, uh, but you understand this. You know. But I don't know if I'm answering you, but don't make. You, you, I'll, I'll give you a simple thing. Dramatic theme is something that you ex express directly in the film. Theme is something that the, the film refers to. Hmm? If it's enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was there. Okay, I'll be, I'll be out here and answer you.